testing. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Great, so let's start. This is expanding yourself and your art through interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaborations. I'm Adriana Gaviria. This session is gonna be facilitated by myself and Michael Leon. Hi. <laughs> uh, the format for, for the session is we're just gonna have a conversation, ask a couple questions from each other here. Uh, you know, if you, Michael is gonna prompt us. And then towards the second half, uh, we'll ask questions to a couple of guests that are in the circle and the last 15 minutes we'll have a Q&A for those that are watching us on HowlRound.TV. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be checking my Twitter. So if you want to ask a question there or on Facebook, I will ask your question. To It could be to any of the guests or anyone in the circle. Michael? Awesome. So um, when Adriana and I were planning this out, we're like, great, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. What does that mean? Do we have to, like, when we started defining it, going to uh, definition.com and stuff like that. So I think a good way to kind of start off the conversation is what does interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary mean to you? Or how do you define it? Yes, we need to speak into the mic, so if you want to raise your hand, we'll walk over. I think that for me, it's, um, or th the, the thing that I like about multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, it's not being confined by the rules of one art form, but being able to draw out and you're constantly learning from not just within the arts, but what uh, methodology is used in science, what, uh, what psychological studies there are, what's happening in the politics, so that you're constantly feeding what you're doing uh, from multiple perspectives. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also think there's there's a difference in the words, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So if you're looking at interdisciplinary, literally meaning like if you're a doctor that all of a sudden is going to become a painter, you're going to have the eyes of that doctor bringing that and all the skills and everything that you have in your mind into the discipline of painting and vice versa, whatever that is. And then sometimes what's interesting about that is that when you're multidisciplinary, you have to kind of shut off one of them because you can't actually um, write a scene the way you write interiority in a novel. And so how do you both be, how can you be interdisciplinary, meaning see with those eyes, but also understand that a medium is a medium and to use it as, at its best and richest capacity, you also have to eliminate certain things. So I think it's the same thing. It's like seeing with the eyes of the other medium or genre and bringing it and crossing over. <laughs> um, in, uh, yeah. in an academic setting, you can have a slightly different meaning. Uh, I've never, 
I want to be able to observe the, the situation where they call a, an opportunity or a class interdisciplinary. It usually means you have somebody from architecture uh, and somebody from theater teaching a class together. Uh, or there's a project that's being worked on. Maybe uh, I remember a few years ago they uh, they had a project for the graduate students in architecture uh, uh, building a theater in downtown Miami, uh, you know, on paper. And they involved uh, the theater design students and and, uh, and directing students and uh, were involved in helping that out. Uh, we have a, a project with uh, with the visual arts department that that. Uh, they create a, a, a contest among their best designers to put our posters together for our season. Uh, so that's what I thought of as interdisciplinary as, uh, in an academic setting is somehow two different disciplines getting together to teach a class or work on a project. Uh, I was thinking of um, the question on kind of a big, um, broader level so it's great, everything I'm hearing to help me contextualize, but now I'm even more confused. Um, <laughs> so multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. I also think of bringing back to the questions of our, our multicultural Latinidad in this country and in our home countries, or our ancestors' home countries, that those countries are also many times, most, most of the time, three or more cultures. Um, and I think of um, the reflection of theater and art in, in Latin America, including the United States. And I think of, um, by nature, um, kind of our the theatrical pageantry innate in our different cultures. So there is mask work present a lot of the time. There is dancing present a lot of the time. It's a theatrical um, present. There's there's dialogue present. There's you know punto contra punto people reciting poetry back at each other present. There is you know zapateo just all feet present. And then you have the whole uh, aspect of performance site specific, right? It's on a ruin. It's in you know whatever in the in the forest, in the Amazon, wherever it is. So I'm thinking in that broader sense that huge rich culture, cultures that we have that are by nature interdisciplinary. It's actually when we get here that you're not allowed to do what the other person does. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to stay in your, I'm the writer. So I even wanna challenge that notion about the writing, the dialogue or the novel. Does it have to be? different parts of our brain. Um, how do you put that, you know, the letter on stage? We did see a play about letters on stage. You know, how do you fold time on stage? Is, is there an eight hour performance that happens outside? Maybe. Is, you know, or because there are some things that happen indoors that happen over, you know, three days. You go to three different performances. Anyway, I just wanted to open up that all that is um, in our DNA and beyond, just a, an experience of our, of our cultures. Anybody else? So I learned to write, my first monologue I wrote for a movement class. And I also learned to write by going to museums because I figured that artist has that one shot to give you their story. They're using texture, color, composition, scope, the materials that they're using. And then I thought of that as I was building my monologues. And I also think I was oh, totally in love with this like jazz pianist, like an idiot. <laughs> so I was listening to a lot of jazz and I would just listen to a lot of music and there was a Mondrian exhibit at MoMA. And when I saw that he had based uh, Boogie Woogie on Boogie Woogie, and then when you, if you know Boogie Woogie and you look at it, that painting, you see it. So that became very, that like music and art are a natural part of my writing. So I don't even think of it as something different. Like, I think, like, as human beings, we take the, I go see a lot of dance. As human beings, we take a lot of inspiration from life and put it into our, at, into our work through all our senses, the way that we see it. So I think it's, I, I think these discussions of multiple, dis inter, multiple, ugh, to me, it just, it's a, a natural way that I learned how to do it because I'm self-taught. 
and 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 sometimes I think that's kind of like it it happens organically, and I think it's more about what Rosa was saying about getting out of our own way a little bit and just letting these natural things things that feel natural to you you know um happen and find the the ways in which other artists in other disciplines found ways to express the depth the complication you know how how do i ju why, how do i juxtapose these two colors how do i juxtapose these two characters is is i often think in terms that are not theatrical or not having to do anything with writing actually I usually think in terms of paintings or music when I'm writing, and it's just because I taught myself, and I went to what inspired me. So that those meanings to me, it's like, yeah, that's what we do. We we put life on or whatever. Or if we're using our imagination, we're going to use the receipts that sparked our imagination to make our work. So to me, it just feels very natural. It doesn't feel something that's foreign at all. I was just saying I have a very brief, I feel like Elvis, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now it's not so brief. Uh, but uh, no, I, I was just thinking, we were, th we were mentioning uh, Maria de Nifornes the other day, who was a painter and uh, never really became this great playwriting teacher without having really studied playwriting. So anyway, that's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's important to stay open to uh, our own innate uh, unfettered curiosity, right? And not silo ourselves, thinking I'm this, I'm that. Professionally, even within what could broadly be considered our discipline, I'm multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary because I, I work as a writer, I work as a producer, I work as a director, I work as an actor. Beyond that, I have interests in things that seem relatively far flung. When you think about the, the money that the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's putting into storytelling, dealing with STEM issues, and really having to dig into that and understand it to a distinct degree. I mean, how, how long has the uh, stereotype been around that people of letters and people of science are very different kinds of people, right? But the reality is that a ton of really fascinating stories, and sure, some that are not so great, but a, a ton of really fascinating stories have opened themselves up to us because people of letters and people of science have been willing not only to speak with one another, but to realize that there are blurred boundaries between us. We're not necessarily inherently so completely different. And foundationally, by really understanding the science inherent to a specific story that's being told, I then can turn around as an artist, utilize that information more fully, and tell a richer story. And I think that that's interdisciplinary as well, not just in the creation of, the execution of how we tell the story, but why do we even tell the story, and what story do we choose to tell, right? Um, I think, uh, w as, as you said, we're all uh, multidisciplinary in many ways. I think when it comes to a moment, though, when we, uh, there is a discipline that we are unfamiliar with. Like if I wanted to incorporate ballet into a play, I was, uh, you know, there, there's no way I'm a ballet dancer, right? So uh, then I'm interested in how to best serve the piece uh, incorporating what this new discipline has to offer and how we can collaborate together to begin to create something c completely out of our both of our experience. Awesome. So I think we could segue now into what brought you into the room? What are you hoping to get out of this conversation? Um, just briefly, hopefully. Um, I guess inter, multi, anything that has to do with crossing a bridge, I want to be there. I really like the, the bridging that's been sort of my whole life, um, which shared probably with everyone in this room. So between north and south, that bridge is interesting to me. Born in South America, raised in Seattle, moved back to South America, back to Seattle. I also, my work, my daily life is in a hospital, so, and my theme is type 2 diabetes. I'm a diabetes nerd. And I, <laughs> I want to bridge that and playwriting. And um, so that's influenced a lot of, of the plays that I've written and directed. So this bridge thing, and it's really related to the multi and inter. Because in your life, you approach people and... Um, you know, they got their thick story, their layers of stories. 
and and that includes um, the doctor that walked into the room. They got their story, and then the homeless patient that's you know singing on the street. They got their story. So anyway, I, that's what attracted me to you guys in this circle, the intermulti, which I think we are. Um, I what drew me into this room was curiosity more than anything um, and to listen and hear what that looks like for our, all of you um, I think as performers especially nowadays it's kind of a given that we're expected to be actors who move or actors who sing and we're not just singers and actors and dancers but we have to automatically be this package and I wonder how that translates in other disciplines or if you're an actor who's a playwright or an actor who's a director and a second addendum as a woman growing up, I was always pushed toward the stage and to act and to act. And I've always thought, well, I kind of maybe want to direct someday. But I felt like those opportunities weren't presented to me as the first thing, the first option. It was like, well, you're, you're kind of cute and you can do a thing, so be the actress. But I'm like, OK, well, what if I wanted to be the director? And I feel like just mentoring young women, especially in wi female identifying actors and performers, who to be pushed out of those boundaries as well. I liked hearing you say, Carmen, um, that you're self-taught. That to me, growing up, was had such a negative connotation that if you did not go to a prestigious school and you did not study to be something specific, then we're not really invited into the room in the same way. And I think I was raised with the notion of I had to be the best at one thing in order to succeed. If you wanted to try out different things, you were kind of setting yourself up for failure. So I am perpetually fascinated by the concept that I can actually do more than one thing um, because I am more than one thing. Um, and learning to like now see that when I do say that I'm self-taught, to say that with pride. Um, oh, I'm going to steal that. I'm Pedro Al Almodovar, basically. <laughs> I think that that's something that um, I don't. I don't know if it's necessarily like study not study, mm -hmm. uh, but something that I've uh, that I think builds multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary people is people who get adventurous and trying something that they didn't necessarily go to school for. Right? Like I'm sitting next to the creative nonfiction, you know, studied writer who's written multiple things, but has also she's constantly always bringing in that sort of perspective into her playwriting work and it's because you know I th and and things like I was a performer and then I knew how to direct performers because I knew what it's like to get in there and you're like okay so it's something actually quite beautiful that people who get adventurous or like I wonder if I did this um, makes us multidisciplinary and I also think that we have to remember constantly that the world didn't come already with a rule book and this is how the world works. I think that we like we make the rules. So somebody wrote the rules that uh, there was a writer, a director, and this and that, and then we followed it. So we can start changing the rules if we want. Um, yeah, I heard you use the word adventurous, which is something that I actually, like I think um, something I'm looking for in this conversation is conversations about fear of embracing a new medium or exploring a new territory or, you know, venture that you've never explored before. Um, I think that's what often gets people siloed into theater or like into just the thing, the one thing that you studied. And I'm always, I'm interested in hearing how people have handled their own fear of, oh, I'm not, I, how do I, I don't know how to code. Why should I try to be a video game designer or something like that, right? Because that is actually like a thoughts that I've had and I'm, I guess I'm curious to hear from the room like how um, you handle that fear and I think what brought me into the room was the cake in the corner. If I had to be totally honest, I'm hoping somebody's going to cut it because it's Meninga cake and it smells delightful. <laughs> That's probably what brought me into the room. But as far as being multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and this thing that you're taught to, b 
both of you, what I would say is, you know, I, I went to school for acting, right? But then I taught myself how to write. And also my first uh, solo show, I produced, I did all the marketing. You know, I, I, I chose the, like, it, it's something out of need. So it's just like, when you speak about fear, it's funny because when I was younger, I was too dumb to know that I had to be scared. So it's just like, oh, it's so courageous of you. And I'm thinking courageous really it's just necessity like if you're not going to do it who's going to do it and the other thing is like why not you do it like really like we're not in a war zone most of us you know we're not it's 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 fear of failure is a silly thing that we've been like that's been injected into us by people that 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 are smart enough to fail and keep going and they just want to eliminate the competition i think failing is amazing fail fast and i think that the things that are born out of necessity are going to only expand our repertoire are going to only make a stronger artist and failing is good i've never learned from my successes i've only learned from my failures which have been plenty so I, i'm grateful for every one of them and it's like good do your video game and mess it up because then the set, your next video game is going to be awesome. And I think we've gotten, after fucking Reagan, everything had to be like so perfect and this like veneer of perfection. And that's really boring to me. That basic bitch stuff is just like, I have no time for it. So I think like out of need, we become multidisciplinary. And to me, it's much more interesting not to have resources than to have them. Because that's really, to me, where creativity happens and where mistakes happen and where growth happens. So that, that to me is a connective tissue of really building a very strong career. And cake. <laughs> um, so a couple things. I, uh, you know, we have more access to information with a lower barrier of entry in terms of finances than we've ever had before in human history, right? So first and foremost, if you're interested in learning about it, you can, right? I took a couple of different, recently in the past couple of years, a couple of different video game writing courses because I'm interested in doing that too. But the reality is that if I didn't have the funds available to pay for that online course, I could have also just picked up a couple of the books that I used in that course. I could have tried out different things. Um, you can use Twine for free in order to write branching narratives, right? Which you don't only use, by the way, if you want to try writing branching narratives for a game. If you want to try it for a, a different sort of, like a, for a performance piece, right? And you want to have the audience choose at this point, like choose your own adventure. Okay, let's go this way. Right, like what you guys do, right? I don't know if y'all use Twine. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Okay, I copy that. <laughs> you know, I do recommend though that you check out. I do recommend though that you check out Twine because it's it's very very basic coding. It's nearly nothing when it comes to that, and it really helps you organize the decision branches where it's like, okay, if we go this way, then this happens, and you really keep the the variables in mind. Yeah, no, legitimately, legitimately. I'll, I'll, we we can talk more about it afterwards. Twine, Twine is a really really useful tool. Um, no, but uh, to speak more broadly to the question of interdisciplinary. I've always, I've had these conversations since I was a child. I was lucky to grow up in the theater and around television. I was trained as, a, as an actor, first and foremost, although I, my mother's a writer, I've been around writers, right? So I got into writing um, really early on, and then I went on to study film and television production. And then I continued to develop as a theater artist on the side of that, right? And then when I graduated, I did the theater artist stuff, and then I moved back here, and I'm actually back here now in this room uh, because I'm trying to more formally rejoin the theater community after spending a number of years really focused on film and television work, right? Um, I feel like the different hats that I wear, even just within what it is that we do, broadly speaking, as a writer, a director, a producer, an actor, working in film and television, documentary, and in, in fiction work, uh, in theater, in various forms of theater, Shakespeare, uh, improv, there's all sorts of different ways that we can slice this question of interdisciplinary, right, and multidisciplinary. Um, all of it makes me better at all of it, right? If I follow that curiosity and I'm listening to, to my voice inside, so I'm not just being pushed, which I've felt that pressure too in a different way than what you're describing, but if I'm not just pushed into one area where it's like, this is what people want you to do right now, so just keep doing it because it's an easy thing to do, um, and I listen to myself, like you were listening to yourself, it sounds like, and oh, I might be interested in directing at some point. Stay open to that, and then your, your uh, experience as an actress will make you a better director. If you write, 
your experience as a writer will make you a better director, and your experience as a director will make you a better writer, you know? Because you are, to, to Carmen's point, just a person. And actually, to your point also, we're not the labels that we put on ourselves. We're just people, we're just artists. In the broadest sense, we're just, we're storytellers, right? And all of these are tools. And whatever the, f am I allowed to swear because of this thing? I did. Okay, great. Whatever the fuck you want to put in your toolbox, because it's going to be a useful tool for you, don't let anybody stop you from doing that. All right? Thank you. So let's, um, so just taking, just listening to what you guys have to say. So what if you are an artist and there is a discipline that you are really curious about and you want to open yourself to that and you have a project and you want to include that in, in your project, how do you go about that? Um, so I'm going to ask Paul, uh, who has a project called We Have Ide, and um, just talk a little bit about how your, your process and uh, thanks for everybody uh, giving your your opinions and your your experiences out there. I, I appreciate the the back and forth. So the honesty is really powerful and learning too from folks. Um, so I have a project called We Have Ide, and it is both interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. I love mixing and bringing uh, different things together in theater. Um, I have a hard time just watching straight up dialogue on stage for 90 minutes. That's tough for me to do. And especially if it's dialogue, you're just standing there or sitting on a couch. I, it's hard, you know, I wanna see people sweat. I wanna see movement. I want energy expressed on stage. Um, so for myself, this project We Have E-Day was really about um, having the best collaborators inside a multidisciplinary piece where there is a um, choreographer, a full live band, a DJ, dancers, and actors. So it's like a musical in a lot of ways, except for the interdisciplinary part, where the choreographer is also acting, right? So he is playing himself. He's actually he's not a trained actor, but he's actually, the, the, the choreographer is telling his story about coming from the mountains of Santiago de Cuba, right, uh, being tricked into becoming a dancer by people, th by the, the school, the dance school telling him he was gonna learn karate. <laughs> Come learn karate because we need men to join this, the dance school, young boys to learn how to dance. So really, you know, we're asking all the, all the boys to come out into the playground and learn karate. Okay, you're the most flexible, you're going to dance school to learn to be a ballet dancer. That was how he got, he got sucked in. So I wanted him to tell that story, right? He's a tall black dude who you look at him, long dreads, you would, you would like, you know, he's very masculine, six, four. This guy's moving beautifully on stage, but he never talks, because in his role uh, in, in dance, he's always just moving. He's telling a great story with his body, but I want to hear him talk too, and I want him to dance, right? Um, so having him tell his own story as a choreographer, as an immigrant, as a black man, um, and dancing at the same time was, was outstanding. He wasn't the greatest actor. He forgot a bunch of lines. <laughs> um, but he came from a very authentic place, which was his own voice. Um, the same thing goes with uh, the DJ, um, DJ Ladies. This is a, a, another black woman from Cuba who took a balsa across the ocean, right, and was lost at sea, um, left her family and her daughter in Cuba to be a DJ and could have died easily. Um, and then there she is in the middle of, of the ocean, and she, 10 years after that, is playing for President Obama in the White House. So who could tell that story? Yes. I have her tell a little bit of the story, and then I, and I also brought in an actress. That actress um, uh, is telling Ladies' story. Ladies is telling a little bit of it, um, but then she comes in, and then she's singing. The actress is singing the text that based on Ladies' story. Um, how do we get to the songs? This was really cool. This is what, what's an asset about having Rosalba Rolón in the room. Um, Rosalba is an excellent director of actors, but she can also write songs. So, and she can direct um, composers. And so she took my text based on Lady's story 
and she found a song in it, gave this section, didn't change any of the words, but says, this is a song. It is? It's a song. She gave it to Yosvani Terry and said, Yosvani, this is a song, compose the melody. Yosvani goes, yeah, it, it could be a song, right? Um, uh, it's my mother, Yemaya. Dun, 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 dun. It's my mother, Yemaya. He took one line and created a melody out of it. And so now the actress who's playing ladies is singing this song. And so this is uh, an interesting interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, docu-theater, multimedia, where we're actually interacting with the screen at the same time. We took live footage of um, whole trips through the campo and filmed uh, the participants' uh, family members. And so Ramon the Monchi, the guy playing the dancer, is actually interacting with the screen with, with his uncle who just had just died right, right after we filmed this. He's talking with his uncle, the, un the uncle's responding. We use the responses as, as if they're having a conversation. So it's also multimedia. It's multimedia, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Two composers, a DJ and a four person jazz band. Four actors, three dancers. We, we, what, uh, the other thing about multidisciplinary was how do we get, how do we tell the story, how do we tell the story with multiple access points. We're telling the story in three languages, English, Spanish, and Yoruba. Folks who don't understand um, Spanish are looking at the supertitles, but we didn't translate the Yoruba neither. So we want the dance to interpret the song. So the dancers are doing a piece for Yemaya or Ochun, right? And that is corresponding to the story of one character praying to Yemaya to save her in the middle of the ocean. With the song going, the dancers, the text. That to me is amazing. That's beautiful. That, that is like a vision, right? That was the vision that I had. So in, in order to have a really dope multidisciplinary piece, I don't think you should put it all on yourself. Okay? Yes, experiment, do things you want to do, but get the best people you can to do the best type of work. If you can't afford it, that's fine. I'm not a ballet dancer either. I can't do modern dance, right? Um, I can write and I can act. That's what I can do. Uh, but I think if you have the opportunities to bring in the, the best people um, to do those things, now they're not always gonna tell their own story. Not every choreographer wants to act. That's why they're dancing. But the, the last thing I wanted to say is I came to this, um, this gathering in LA in 2017 and brought up an issue about the lack of, of Afro-Latinos in, in our community uh, being on stage, right? And a lot of the responses that people were telling me before were like, oh, well, there aren't that many Latino, Afro-Latino actors. We don't have that pipeline. I said, well, okay, so we could just erase people and forget them on stage, or we can start taking chances on bringing people from other disciplines to act. And that's what I did. Um, and, and I felt like, we're gonna sacrifice a little bit of the quality of acting, but the authentic story and our community will be re represented. So which one do you wanna do? Because I'm not gonna do the blackface. Um, and, and I feel like that was really, really important that we did that. So this, this show was not only multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary and multimedia, but it was also kind of addressing the Afro-Latino experience in uh, our community. Thank you. <laughs> um, so much of what you said made me think of things. I'm trying to organize them in my head. Um, two words come to mind. Uh, uh, one is necessity, and the other is serendipity. I think it's two th ingredients that often lead us to reach out beyond our discipline. Um, I was listening to NPR yesterday or the day before because I'm a middle-aged liberal and it's the law. Uh, and uh, they were interviewing this guy who must be about 80 now. And in the 1940s, he was this, uh, I think his name is Cohen, he was this Jewish guy from New York who fell in love with uh, uh, Latin drums, bongos and such. And he used to go to uh, Birdland and all these places in New York to yeah, I think so. Yeah. Latin, he's the founder of Latin percussion. 
And, and serendipity was that just around the time he wanted to learn how to make bongos, uh, the, the, the embargo against Cuba started and they couldn't get any real Cuban drums. And uh, the necessity was that he really, really wanted to do this. And the serendipity was that he would have to do it himself. So he became uh, this amazing, amazing drum maker by calling up his musician friends and saying, how do you make a drum? Mm. And now he's this, this established person and makes this incredible uh, percussion instruments. And uh, Anyway, I thought that was an example of... of uh, and sometimes it's just taking advantage of opportunity. We're going to go see a play this afternoon by Rudy Goblin, and Rudy Goblin was a dancer uh, who, along with my colleague Michael Yanni, started making these shows, and then suddenly became a writer, and now he's going to Yale to study playwriting. Uh, that may be just because he's Rudy Goblin and he's amazing, but uh, the, the necessity sometimes comes from the heart. Uh, that's enough for me. I had other ideas, but I want to. I want to get Orlando to respond to. <laughs> thank you for putting me on the spot here. <laughs> uh, but I, I really, first of all, I want to thank you um, for what you're doing, for incorporating the diversity of who we are as Hispanic, because Hispanic is not only one race. Hispanic is a multitude of 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 race. Um, that create this community. Um, also want to thank you for what you just said regarding not using blackface, not trying to, to put an actor or an actress uh, who is not black to pretend to be black, to pretend to be an Afro-Latino or an Afro-Latina uh, on stage. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a very important, um, and, um, and, and I congratulate you for, for making that, that statement as well. Um, the incorporation also of the, the religious aspect of who we are of Afro-Latino, Afro also an, an awesome thing to do. Because the religion aspect of the Afro-Latino is something that, that has been demonized, unfortunately, over the history. Um, and many people have this uh, false idea or false notion that has been imposed through society and, and people is that everything that the black community or the Afro-Latinos do in terms of their religion is evil and, and in reality is not. Is that what they make you think? Is that what they make you believe? Uh, and so, uh, uh, and, and by you incorporating all those elements into it, you are making a statement to the public and saying, this is okay, this is, this is all right. I mean, this is not something that you should reject or, or, or just uh, put aside. Uh, something to learn you know, from uh, the history and, and the experiences. So I, I really, I'm really pleased to hear that. And, and I wish you know, a lot of people can be able to um, uh, open up uh, also to, to have that diversity uh, involved into a, a, a stage which we don't see. And the last thing I want to make, to uh, the comment I want to make also, you, because you made it, uh, you, you um, stated, uh, is that um, I have heard people also said the same thing, and that is, well, um, we don't have um, a black Hispanics that can, that can do this. We don't have um, black Hispanics, um, Afro-Latinos uh, actors or act actresses to perform a particular area. Or uh, in my case with the uh, um, Ernesto Gamboa project, we were looking for uh, a company uh, with an, um, that had uh, Afro-Latinos in, in their understaff. And the answer that I got was, uh, well, Afro-Latinos are not interested in, in, in PR. I mean, th that's, that's a racial statement. Right there, and I'm and this is not, <laughs> this is not from an Anglo. This is from a Hispanic person, okay. So um, th thank you. It's from our own community. So what you're doing is an awesome thing. I mean, uh, and and you have my support, and this. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. And or, or I um. I want to speak a little bit to about what you said. Or I, I Orlando and I didn't know each other, but when I was talking to people in the community and thinking about who I wanted to connect with, I found you online. 
And so when I spoke to Orlando, Orlando's like, well, I, I don't really do theater. And I'm like, it doesn't matter because we, we have to have this conversation together and we are all, yeah, we are all in, involved in this together. And, we're, and, and like Rose said, it's in our DNA that we work um, together as a group, even if, if we go outside of our primary discipline, whatever that is. Um, which leads us to Vicky. I would love for you to talk about unconventional partnerships, for example. It's up to me to talk about unconventional um, <laughs> partnerships. Great. Uh, so I, again, I think that, that um, Paul said something really smart. The best advice I've ever gotten was work with people who are smarter than you. <laughs> if you're the smartest person in the room, you failed, um, which I have run with that. Um, and what's happened, it's, um, I've had many opportunities uh, especially recently to collaborate not only multidisciplinary in the sense of like w in the arts, but also with people outside of the arts, which is the work that we do. Um, actually, I think that a, a bunch of the work that we that gets requested from us, like we have maybe a theater going, hey, we want to work with you guys, but usually it's people like from NGOs or from different organizations that are like, hey, we are looking to cause empathy with other human beings and we know that you guys make art that does that with people. Um, so a big part of our work has been to collaborate with non-artists and try to get to communicate the thing that they do. Um, a main thing that we have to understand or that I have learned is that um, the audience is not stupid and just because you're the theater artist doesn't mean that when you collaborate with someone that they don't have amazing input on what theater is. And when we're talking about theater, right? Like you have, sometimes you get the best ideas from the corporate guy. And it's, you're like, you're the corporate guy, but sometimes the corporate guy um, is the one that's saying, hey, wait, I don't understand what you're saying. What are you trying to um, communicate to me? And you're getting like, the, I think that some, I'm gonna say something really gross, I'm so, I embarrass her all the time. But, um, <laughs> but like sometimes we get into the theater circle jerk and this sort of like, we're so smart. Oh my God, we're so good at what we do. <laughs> that sometimes we forget that the reason we do it is to make the grander community. Um, and I think that uh, one is learning how to, what I've learned is how to speak in other people's languages and understanding that that's not false that is communication. So I'm not gonna, it's, it's under making things in the terms that somebody else can, I mean, that's what theater is. I'm making a play so that you understand this point of view. Um, I, I wish there was, this was more conversational uh, because right now it feels like a monologue and I know that in five seconds I'm gonna wanna say something a little bit more <laughs> intelligent, but I think, I think that the, the main thing I've learned is know what you bring to the table and know how that, I don't know anything, ab I didn't know anything about liquor. And now I can, you know, and then now this story about rum came into my life and it's actually not a story about rum, it's a story about exile, it's a story about immigration, it's a story about people, what it means to leave everything behind. There's a difference between saying, we always say this, uh, there's, you can say in a sentence, you have to leave, every my, my grandparents left everything behind. You could do that, or you can put someone through the journey of actually leaving everything behind. And understanding that that story didn't come necessarily from um, us just, it, we've always wanted to tell stories like this. Something that connected us was th that we wanted to tell the same stories. But the fact that somebody was like, somebody needs to understand why this rum exists and why this, like somebody needs to know the story. And it wasn't a theater maker. It wasn't that person. And for people that are watching, you're talking about? I'm talking about the Amparo experience right now in downtown Miami. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm talking about that. And what's happening is that now other people are like, but we want you to tell the story of where our, our, how our company came to life, how, how, why my mission exists. Like that's what's, what I find very exciting now about the future of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary is that now people are asking for theater makers to tell their story. There's a, there's a new hype coming up, and I love it, to storytelling, which is the nature of who we are. We are storytellers since the beginning of time. And I do hope that that feeds back into the theater because these were ideas that were presented to theaters. 
and they said no but that's not this but that's not this and we are we are inherently multidisciplinary multicultural code switching that's what we do we are theater is all of that it's many things to many people it's putting all kinds of experts in a room to talk to each other and make a thing but when you go and you say you know there's i think one of the best things that was ever said to me was that uh, talent is just guts and desire and it's the guts to kill the fear to go study the thing. And there are different ways of studying. And sometimes that studying is putting different kinds of people in a room. Right. And it's the desire to put those people in that room together. But if you're gonna say, I'm theater, like what is theater, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, there is a hope that all of this kind of collaboration that's happening outside can then feed back into whatever whatever theater becomes in the second half of the 20th century, 21st century. Um. For both of you, Vic, for uh, I, uh, I don't know who dealt with this, but it, when you go across cross disciplines to business, which seemingly would be antithetical to, to what we do, uh, in theory a great idea. But both these disciplines, both these areas have management structure and power structures that are already built in. So does that have to be dealt with from the top? Who makes decisions about what happens before you start to be creative? Something that's great is that you're the expert in the room about being creative. That's the one thing. I was ready to come in with like, oh, we're talking about corporate. And like when you work in the theater, it's like mm, people with money. Mm. Like there's something that we've, that we've been inherited. And so what, ha what has happened and it, it happens, like she can talk to you especially about the storytelling and, and how she has to deal with like the part of like, these are the words that are being said about us. But we got a lot of freedom. We got a lot of liberty, and what happens with them is that they're executors. And so nobody told me you can't do that thing. You can't, if anything, they're like, okay, so then how do you want it, and when do you want it? And it's like, oh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's not creativity out of limitation. It's creativity with like making sure that you're actually telling the thing, that, that you're not getting gluttonous with opportunity, that you're being specific. And they don't have they don't have the limit at least in our experience so far, they don't limit you and like mm, is that the right choice? They're like okay, you're the expert, so you tell me what comes next. And so there's this weird freedom that you get that has been tremendous. It, it was my grad school. I'll add one thing, which is that I think you can't just go seeking a corporate partner. Mm -hmm. You have to align. Like the stories have to align, the mission has to align, the ideas have to align or it's not gonna work. I think that anyone coming into this that thought this was just about selling rum, this is not their story to tell. And if that's what you think you're doing, then it's not that thing and vice versa, right? So like it has to be aligned, it has to be authentic and it has to be real. You can't just be like, I'm gonna go find someone with money it's it, that's right. the serendipity I think that you're you're talking about you know it's like you're prepared to do the thing you've been trying to do it your whole life here are these people that want to do the same thing let's align I mean mm, you know you don't <laughs> just, to, just to add a little thing <laughs> yeah other people could talk to sorry um but to her point is like we don't have to lose our integrity because money is involved at all and I have yet like I to this I'm hoping that I never get put in that position because so far every single thing I'm like, yes, I wanna fight for that. I wanna fight for that thing and I wanna tell the story and the best tool that we have is that we can make you feel and understand another human being. They have to do the fundraising, they have to do all this stuff, have fun, but we can, we can do the human. I know you have a question, so we'll leave uh, questions for the for the last 15 minutes. Uh, I want to hear from um, Theo, who's going to talk a little bit about the longer you are in this industry, the longer you are uh, creating. There are certain needs that come for you um, in, in your career trajectory. We've, we're talking about financial uh, uh, partnerships uh, or stability. We've talked about uh, going into other disciplines or co or collaborating with other people. But what about for for yourself as an artist. Uh, um, hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thanks again for um, th this conversation. Um, it's definitely deep, thought-provoking, and, uh, and mind-blowing as, as well. Um, so, so for me, I, my, my whole career has been based on devised theater. And um, that's, that's how I've sustained myself by, and, and created work for myself. Um, and I knew that was gonna happen when, um, when I was in school, I, I knew that I was gonna have to become a writer, even though I did not study writing. In that aspect, I am self-taught. And by the way, just because uh, I, I got it, so I did get a BFA, um, but, and, and maybe at the time that I got that BFA, 80% um, of what I knew about the theater came from that education, but today, and then 20% was self-taught, but today I think that's flipped. 20% came from that BFA and 80% is self-taught. Most, and, and, this, and, there, and uh, I will say that, uh, and not to uh, diss any, any cultural institutions, because we're actually sitting in one. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but I did have to teach myself a whole, and I do have my criticisms about, <laughs> about cultural institutions and the Eurocentric approach to, to theater training and, and learning. Um, uh, that being said, I do have a BFA, uh, and and I and I and I earned it. Uh, but yes, uh, in reference to self-teaching, self-taught, uh, I you I had to, and I encourage young people to uh, move beyond the the piece of paper, or what I think KRS one day uh, once called. Actually, it was at a at a lecture he did here uh, at FIU, what, what he called your receipt after four years. Um, so so it, it, is, it is really important that we continue to teach ourselves and we continue to, to learn and uh, uh, expand, especially as, as for me as an artist and as a theater maker. And yes, I am influenced by visual arts. I am totally influenced by music and movement. That is, and you know, to the point where people think, I, I get introduced all the time as a, oh, here's Tel Kassani, he's a choreographer and a dancer. I'm not at all. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a theater artist, but but I do, <laughs> but I do dance, and I and I use dance in my work, in reference to interdisciplinary and and, and multi uh, discipline. Uh, but and and the the longer I am, I, I there hasn't been a, a single theater piece that I've created that I have not posed a new challenge on myself. Mm -hmm. Every new piece I need to imp I have to do something that I have not tried before. Uh, whether I fail or succeed is, is not the point. The point is to expand, keep it interesting and expand my knowledge, expand uh, my, my, my disciplines, uh, if you will. Um, and, and in this, la this last piece that I created, uh, and, and it's also, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go back a little bit to, to, the, to the training. Uh, it's also, um, I believe, again, I strongly believe in, 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 in getting a, a degree, um, but I also, uh, like we said, uh, who did you say was self-taught? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Almodovar and, and Basquiat, I, I, you know, I yelled that out. Um, it, it, it is in, in important that we, there is such a thing that's as, that I call cultural training, mm -hmm. that we come from culture, that is in our DNA, that, com that comes from not only, not, not you don't acquire it in four years, you acquired it in, in 4,000 years, <laughs> or maybe four million. Um, and, and that's deep. Now, that being said, that has to be also watered from an, an exterior event that brings it up. An example, uh, you know, all of a sudden I can, you know, I've never taken uh, Afro-Cuban class in my life, but I can somehow do it. I can somehow dance it. Um, because it is in my DNA. Um, but that had to be triggered by me seeing someone do, oh, I can, oh, wait a minute, I think I, I well, hold, wait a minute, whoa, and I, I got it, right? <laughs> uh, now, not, not, n that's not to say that I cannot go on and train. I just actually started training at, at, at my ripe old age. I, am, I started training in bomba dance. And I, I picked the, uh, and I have actually, all I wanted to do was, was learn enough to throw down at a bomba jam. Mm -hmm. and, and I got it pretty quick, <laughs> pretty quickly. I threw down in my first, as a matter of fact, I put it in my last show. Uh, 
But so yes, I could continue to pushing the boundaries and, and challenging myself. Um, this last piece uh, that, that I created with, with the Combat Hippies, which is a group of, of Puerto Rican uh, veterans, uh, two from the Iraq War and one a Vietnam era veteran. Uh, and he's a percussionist who's played with anybody. Uh, he has a really impressive uh, uh, um, uh, a bio uh, from Tito Puente to uh, Winston Marcellus. Um, I, I decided I was really, really tired of, <laughs> of the, uh, not only of the aspect of the Eurocentric training and that, that frame and that, that model, as a matter of fact, uh, Rudy came to me at the age of 23 as a b-boy and I cast him in a show and, and, that, and his, his, uh, he's still uh, one of my sons, uh, actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but he culturally trained because to be a b-boy or b-girl, you don't, you, you don't learn that in college mm -hmm. and, you, and you need discipline, you need effort, uh, and you need training and, and a lot of hard work. And you cannot become uh, uh, a good uh, f uh, breaker. That's B-boy, B-girl is a uh, break dancer for those of you who, who, um, who understand the misnomer. Um, and um, that is cultural training. And the Iraq v uh, war veterans that I've been working with, uh, um, the veterans that I've been working with, got the same amount of cultural training that in this piece that we developed over a year and a half. Uh, I worked with them actually a little longer than that because we had created, with two of them, had created another piece. But in the four years that they worked with me, they got serious training, serious training. Mm -hmm. And they not, and, 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 and I did not let them get away with, uh, and uh, with, with uh, I was not okay with them not reaching the level of an actor. I was not okay with that. Um, I pushed them to that point of learning how to write because they, they wrote the piece, I, I did a dramaturgical work on it, as well as uh, their performance. And I worked them hard and they were like, damn, I, I, sh I might as well should, I should have gone and got a BFA. <laughs> um, because I'm that serious about that, about the training um, and the, the art form. So this piece, I actually, my new challenge was, was directing in the round. I've never, I had never directed in the round. I really wanted to move away from the Eurocentric proscenium theater. I was, uh, I said, if I have to direct in the proscenium again, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I created, which actually, it's <laughs> it was a double-edged sword because I loved the final product. However, when we began touring, I kind of had to adjust to the proscenium <laughs> theater. <laughs> anyway, so I had to go back and reblock Matt stuff. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, uh, the, the show is being represented uh, 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 by uh, Tommy Kriegsman, uh, an archetype out of New York City, and uh, he knows that our preference is to do it in the theater. But if I have to adjust to the proscenium, or at least a thrust, more of a, I haven't adjusted to full proscenium, but I have adjusted to a thrust stage. It's a great theater, it really is a great theater. It is actually <laughs> a great, I was looking at the space going, yeah, this would be <laughs> perfect. Um, but, um, um, the, so there's new challenges. Um, so I, I guess I touch up, uh, upon a little bit of what everyone spoke of yeah. in reference to training, in yeah. reference to interdisciplinary, and in reference yes. to challenges. Thank you, so now we're gonna open it up to some. Peter. Questions, uh, uh. Rose. Well, I, I had more of a comment. A com or comment. <laughs> um, just responding to you know all these wonderful um, threads of conversation. So just to pick up, uh, one thread was you, I appreciate the move you're on your beyond your degree. So I also I got a BFA. I was like 21, and then I started to live. You know because you have to, um, and then as an a uh, 24 year old I moved to South America for 10 years and I really had to start to learn to do stuff on my own um, so moving beyond um, the degree and kind of um, comparing it not comparing it but another track self-taught but I just want to introduce another a third track 
which is the idea of the maestro and the aprendiz, right? That's the way of learning. So it's not exactly self-taught. So before there was uh, schooling, you fall around, you know, the cobbler, el zapatero, and then you learn to do that, and then pretty soon you're doing your own zapatos, and then you, are you know, start your business. Then you're a business person with a craft, right? So we're all crafts people. So this idea of the having that, journeyman's having that aprendizaje you know that word comes from aprendiz so we have the m the master and the apprentice right so that is also a track and i think that's you know what these guys were doing with you they were having an apprenticeship so and that counts that's valid yeah. that probably is going to impact you in your field more than the classroom work which was great you know i just feel like they're different really i can feel it here like this synapse exploded here, but this one exploded here. I really think they're, they're different parts, and, and the melding of two really is what can give us our special voice. And the other th thread that I saw coming out of here about um, cultural training was the idea of artista and artesano. So from our countries, our home countries, or Latin America, and, and, and worldwide, so we have some great artesanía, right? We have folk people producing amazing embroidery, amazing masks, amazing dance work. So this idea of the artesano is the people. It's everyone's voice. It's in our pageantry. It's in the fiesta popular. It's in the in the everything. So when we, you know, go into a classroom or a escuela de danza, escuela de folklore, we distill it, you know. So maybe it's not a thousand steps to the right. Maybe it's you know twenty. Um, but I think just keeping that notion that we are a legacy of artesanos and how we use that to become artistas and doesn't mean you have to give up the artesano. So in a sense it is, it does belong to everyone. The, the expertise belongs to everyone without leaving behind the, you know, the be rigorous with your practice. Thank you. Thank um, you. So something to just add about uh, partnerships and not being the smartest person in the room, I think it's just a great opportunity to leverage the wealth of resources in our communities outside the theater industry. And I think about um, so often we have like the scrappy artist mentality of like, I'll learn how to do it. Like, I'll just figure out how to I am a, I'm a producer and I'll learn how to do lights and I'll run the soundboard and I'll figure out all these things. I'll write the play myself um, and I'll do the rigging and somebody will die because I don't know how to do the rigging. <laughs> Um, but I think that, you know, I do a lot of engagement work uh, for the theater in Boston that I work at, and there's moments where we have to be like, we actually don't have the expertise here to deal with the trauma that the play brings up. So, like, who's in the lobby to do that? Who's, in the, who's leading the conversation that does that? We don't have the expertise to engage around this thing. We don't have the relationships to go deep into this topic, but people do like people spend their whole lives doing this work and so how are we working with social workers and how are we working with not teaching artists but teachers who are obviously have these skills of artistry um and how are we engaging them in the work and how are we um getting as many voices thinking about their work through the theater so that we're not like half-assing it and and doing work because like you know it can become irresponsible at some point when you're just being the artist who's like endowed with divine creativity. Um, so I think it's a really beautiful opportunity to decentralize what the theater is and um, and make your work better, stronger, and more responsible. I'm I'm very Eurocentric. Funny <laughs> because my sister and I were talking this morning, and she goes, "You know, when you're Cuban, it's hard not to be." I f I feel that my culture is half African, half Spanish, but I grew up with my grandparents talking about Spain the same exact way that my gr my parents talked about Cuba, right? So to me, it's interesting because I I feel like I get to live the best of all worlds. I, I really get the best of all worlds. And I think sometimes it's funny because when you're like, should we have somebody in the lobby? My first very Spanish attitude is like, no, let them deal with it. Like, I just think it's like, you know, just kill them all. Like, I just, that's awful. But it's it's kind of funny too. I don't know, it's, in a way, it's kind of like, we don't always have the tools to deal with it. 
And I think that that's okay sometimes. I think looking for expertise is okay sometimes, but also challenging people to trust your audiences and to go along with you when you're doing something that isn't Eurocentric, I think is really important too. And I think if we're not challenging their, our audiences, we're boring them. And to me, there's nothing worse. Like I'd rather leave a theater pissed off than bored. You know, or I'd rather leave a theater obviously happy or excited and bored. But I just think that it's to me it's funny because we have so many different ways of of achieving the same thing, and it's so wonderful, right? Because we can use these tools because we can pick up a proscenium or we can go to the round. And I I just think I just, it was just again it, maybe because this is the only word I can think of because I'm getting sleepy. But again, it was like that abundance, like how wonderful that I can look at something that Theo produces and totally be moved by it. And he can look something that I produce and be totally moved by it, even though we're coming from two different directions of production. I think what comes down to is finding what you need and what your company needs to make sure that you're getting your complete message out there. Like if you want people to leave feeling horrified, you're not going to put the therapist in the lobby. <laughs> but if you want people to feel horrified, but then have that safe space back into the world, then you're going to do that. I think we have so many choices available to us. And that's what really popped out of this. It's so, so exciting to live in a moment and in a time where we can dig back 4,000 years and look at something that's super provincial or super of a space and bring it into a completely different context and have that as a starting point for this world and this space to hearken back and forth. I think that's kind of amazing that we get to play in this arena. No, no, it's just something, because something that you said sparked something because of what you said. Okay. Um, like, when I discovered Bomba, I was like, oh my God, hold on. <laughs> I can tell the drummer what to do. And it was like this sort of switch of perspective. Like this sort of switch of like the way that the music goes is that the, rum, the drum plays the beat and you move to the beat. That's the way it goes. The drum says what it goes. The drum says, the drum says, the drum says. And the day I discovered Bomba, that I was like, perade. she's moving right now. She's going, ha, da, 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 and he is following her. Hold on. It's the same ingredients. It's the same thing, but constantly. And I think that's what multidisciplinary and inter interdisciplinary does is that it automatically uses the same tools and just goes like this flip the perspective um, that then I think is like, it's just it's just not necessarily being like, we're gonna drag it from somewhere else. It's just like looking at the thing and going, what if, ba, and switching it up. That's all I want. Break it down. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Victor Corian. Um, I was asking if people know what is Bomba, which is, is uh, one of um, Afro-Caribbean, Puerto Rican dance, which is a communication between the drummer and the dancer. I think it's back and forth. I, I think the drummer talks to the dancer, then the dancer responds, and sometimes it's, it's not a monologue between right. you know, the drummer and the dancer. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I don't know, it's, it's part of the, 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 the rich culture that we have in just one island. I think the same thing happened with, with Cuba or Dominican Republic. We are the Caribbean, but each of the island have his own flavor and his own idiosyncrasy. Um, and uh, how, how do I call it? It's very African, it's, it's basically drums and with these huge um, skirts, white skirts, sometimes they put you know different colors, and then basically the female is dancing with uh, the skirt and talking with the skirt and the feet, and then the guy sometimes they use a machete and the, his feet to talk to the drummers and to talk to the women. I mean, it's something that you should see if you don't know because it's difficult to <laughs> describe. Uh, and the music <laughs> is, it's, it's um, like it, it resonates in your, in your chest. So if you have a drop of African in yourself, you definitely will move. And if you don't, you will be like, what the heck? <laughs> so I don't know, there's not a video of the show, but I, I wish 
before the weekend ends that people, I, I have a video so I can show it to you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, you need the uh, drums, <laughs> you know, without the drums. Sorry. <laughs> um, I had a question for the group. Um, I'm obsessed with this idea of um, finding backdoor entrances to access your work. Like to use an example, like I u I've used clay in the past and I'm not a sculptor, I'm not a visual artist, but to help find a structure for a play that I've written and based around a series of prompts. But I guess I'm curious if anybody in the room has ever tried a process like that where they've used a medium they're not familiar with in order to help them understand what they're making. Um, so to that, I've tried to create a practice of watercolor. So, and I'm, and I'm not a visual artist, um, but if I have a play that I'm writing, and watercolor one because it's uh, fast, it's not very messy. <laughs> um, but I only use what fits in a seashell, so it's maybe a teaspoon of water, and very few. And it and it's got my reading glasses, the the paintbrush, the seashell, and when that water's done, I'm done. So it because you know busy life, work. So there is something about short, finite, creative practices. So um, that's one way of, of one invoking the muse and then trying to find a structure. Usually I'll paint maybe the characters or the objects in the play. That was to, p uh, um, to write a play that I'm writing. Another practice that I did while I was gathering myself to direct the journey of the saints, my translation, El Viaje de la Santa, which is a new Peruvian play, I started gathering objects, so for texture and for color, and they were all either rope or wood or things that occurred in nature. So that helped me specifically when I was going to direct the scene in a thrust stage. It helped me kind of visualize my, my, um, my planning, but it was because of those objects. So those are just two personal things that I've used. Um, I have two examples, but I'll just give one. Uh, in the interest of time and hearing from everybody. Uh, I directed Hair uh, a few years back, which if you haven't done it, everybody should get involved. <laughs> it's like joining a family, it's amazing. Um, and I don't know what inspired me, but uh, I was on Christmas vacation before I went back to direct it. Maybe it was summer, I can't remember. And I wandered into a Michaels and went, we all need to make necklaces for each other. And I bought up their supply of everything you make necklaces from. Uh, and I got to the first rehearsal, and two other of the actors in the show had done the same thing. And they were, it was just this amazing way into the play uh, that nobody saw, nobody in, uh, who came to see the show knew anything about. But it was, it was this incredible recognition that the play was not just about a story. In fact, it was, there was no story there whatsoever. It was about uh, uh, family and tribes, and uh, it was an amazing experience, but it started with that, and it wouldn't have been the same show but for that. You know, I just want to go back to what you were saying and, and also what you, you said uh, recently, but I want to congratulate you for taking the initiative to really learn uh, something different, something new, especially the bomba kind of, um, kind of dance there. Um, in the Afro-Latino community, if, if almost from um, Mexico, uh, Veracruz, which thank God that they are, and the Afro community, Afro uh, Mexican community are coming out uh, strongly, um, all the way to South America. Uh, the rhythm is almost the same, and and the communication with the drums are the same, uh, in the sense that um, you have the person uh, dancing. At, at to the rhythm, and at the same time, it has that that dance is basically a way of speaking. the The drum, the sound, the rhythm is speaking to the body, is speaking to the heart, is speaking to the soul, is speaking to their ancestor. So it's it's a it's a theatrical kind of per performance there uh, uh, of communicating with um, bringing the the past into the present and and, and the art, the dance, and it's so beautiful. Uh, I I I'm I'm doing a research uh, right now on and and the Afro Latino community, the uh, Afro religion community, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm, I think I know a little bit more than what I knew a couple years ago. Um, 
But I also learned about the uh, the bembe, the bembe, the dance and all that. Uh, and, and I and I looked into uh, YouTube t- um, for a, a video like that, and they were dancing and doing all this all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm and I'm sitting on the couch watching it, and I, and I find myself somehow moving. You know, it's like it's you know getting into getting into the groove. I, it was an unconscious kind of situation there. And then I, I woke up, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm dancing to this too, uh, but because it, it really it draws you right into it. And the other thing I want to make uh, to a comment is that you know that uh, every time the Afro Latino community get together to celebrate something, that's theater right there. Yeah. It's organic theater right there. Because they uh, uh, they are performing um, is something uh, not only tradition and doing any r- religious ritual, but it also acting. They are also um, uh, you know uh, using every every uh, part of their bodies and every element uh, available to them to really create that kind of um, event or or ritual or dance. Um, not necessarily for the public that that are observing and watching. But they they doing it for either the God that they're worshiping to or the saints they're worshiping to, and they do it in such a beautiful way. Imagine transforming that organic theater that people in Latin America are doing right now in the Afro Latino community, bringing it up on stage. That would be a wonderful thing to to really um, create and 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 project to um, to the public. And I'm, I I believe that uh, you will have uh, uh, an audience. That that you are not reaching out right now coming to to, um, to your theater. I just, I just want to add real quick that, uh, that, that actually the, the, uh, um, the, the dancer controlling the drum is, is, is rooted in, in, Af- in several African traditions and dance, uh, as well as Balinese, by the way. The Bal- yeah, Balami- yes, flamenco as well. And just like listening to all of this and realizing that it's just all call and response. Like yeah. everything we do is yeah. just call and response. You know, you make a tapestry because that's the way that you can respond to music or the Mondrian or, you know, interdisciplinary is just call and response. It's all of it. So listening to this is just like I said, I had just a little personal brain explosion. <laughs> Adding to that, like I've had monologues that I have, the I would I have a monologue inspired by the the jazz pianist playing the piano, and then it was I, I created the rhythm of her, the woman's speech to replicate. She was a singer, but then I created the rhythm of her speech to replicate a Cuban jazz piece, and then like I've used loteria cards. I have a loteria play series where I pick a couple of the Loteria cards, the Mexican bingo game, I don't know if you guys know it, I love those freaking cards. So I pick a couple of Loteria cards and whatever the um, the cards on the spire, I go to the number, if it's a flower, I think of the flower, what it smells like, the texture, the feel of the flower, what that invokes in me. If it's a boat, I think of a time that I was in a boat and then I create the characters based on those images but they can be something very tactile or something that smells. Um, so I guess that is still being inspired by art, but art and music, I think really, like um, I pull a lot from that for rhythms. I'm a very musical writer. There's always a rhythm to everyone, to the way that my characters speak, you know? And then the Loteria cards are like a treasure trove because every time it's a different combination. So it's wonderful that way. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to wrap up this session. This, this conversation doesn't end because you have the rest of today and tomorrow. To If you have any burning questions with each other, just look around the room. This is a very rich room. Uh, there's future, co- future possible collaborations here. And I hope that this session served as an inspiration for what, c- what you can uh, think of what your next challenge can be.